Knowing the importance of examining the water and energy budgets together, we'll start by examining the basics of calculating an energy budget and then link water and energy budgets together. The authors state that the radiative energy absorbed by a surface is the balance between incoming and outgoing radiation. Now, as I stated before, this is a pretty simple diagram of how we calculate energy budgets. And again, we're primarily thinking of fluxes in to a pool and fluxes out of that pool, instead of thinking about pool, flux, pool in that order. And really in its simplest, we need to think about the energy that's coming into the earth and then the energy that's coming out of the earth and the transformation of energy from the type of energy and the amount of energy coming in to the types of energy and the amounts of energy going out. The differences in energy in and energy out are thought of as a net balance. And it'll be important later to think about what the net energy balance is of the earth and whether on the whole we're gaining or losing energy. Now that was a pretty simple representation of the energy budget of the earth. Energy comes in and energy goes out. And you can see that as we start to get more complicated, we're going to think about the incoming solar radiation. And here there are units that are associated with watts per meter squared. We'll deal with the energy budget on a relative scale instead of an absolute scale. But we have energy that's coming in and a whole bunch of different fates for that energy. It can get reflected, it can get absorbed, and then different things happen to the energy that's been absorbed. And we'll also talk about how there's transformation of that energy as far as its wavelength is concerned. Going from relatively short wave, so high energy particles, to relatively low energy particles. So the key for thinking about the energy budget is really doing an ecosystem scale radiation budget. And again, thinking about our definition of an ecosystem, what we tend to do is take an area that's going to have relatively similar properties and then do the radiation budget. So for a given area, we'll think about the energy coming into that area, the typical transformations of that energy, and then the energy that's leaving the area. And again, we're going to think about gross radiation, so the amount of radiation coming in and coming out, as well as net radiation budgets. So how much gets stored over a given period of time. And the typical units, again, are watts per meter squared. So it's the amount of energy per unit of area. And watts per meter squared is pretty typical for discussing energy budgets. Now the authors take the basics of what we just described and put that in equation form. So what they show is that the net radiation budget is really calculated by the difference in the amount of energy coming in and out. And the difference between in and out, in and out, gives you your net radiation budget. And the partitioning of the radiation budget is really between short wave, which is here, is represented by K, and L, which is your long wave radiation. And so that's pretty a pretty fundamental separation of the energy that we're thinking about both going in and out of the ecosystem, or at least the surface of the ecosystem, and the short wave and long wave radiation. Short wave, again, is going to have more energy, long wave, a lot less energy. Now the the diagram that they show, the figure that they show that starts to partition or show the partitioning of energy starts here. So on the left we have our short wave radiation and the amount of incoming solar radiation here is in relative units and that's 100. And you can see coming down that a bunch of different things happen to short wave radiation. Some of that is reflected and that's called shown by the backscatter and that's 6 units and you can also have a reflection by the clouds and that's 16 units. So already almost a fourth of the energy has been reflected back upwards into space. And then there's also reflection by the surface, which goes like this. There's absorption, 
by water and vapor, dust, ozone, and also by clouds. And that's 23. And then absorption of direct solar radiation or diffuse sky radiation here too. And we'll talk about the difference between direct and diffuse in a little bit. So those are some of the face of shortwave radiation entering the atmosphere and then to the surface of the Earth. And then long wave radiation, which are the lower energy particles. The long wave starts here and you have long wave radiation that is released from the surface of the Earth and goes and is absorbed by clouds, CO2 or ozone. And some of that long wave radiation is radiated back downwards. And then you have emission back into space. And then here are smaller parts of the equation sensible in latent heat flux. So that, in a nutshell, is the basic patterns of radiation, so short wave radiation and long wave radiation. But again, that simple equation that we had really just said, we take a look at the amount of short wave radiation coming in, and that would be 100 units. The amount of short wave going out is 30, and that's balanced by the amount of long wave radiation coming out, which here is 70. And again, they're not showing any long wave radiation entering into the atmosphere, only short wave radiation. So that's a very simple energy budget, 100 equals 30 plus 70. Lastly, there's daily patterns to the energy balance of ecosystems, and we'll often average out over an annual basis or a daily basis. But if you take a look at it over the course of a day, you can see that there's some pretty basic patterns that make a lot of sense as far as the patterns of shortwave radiation coming in. And again, here the authors use an S instead of a K. But shortwave radiation coming in during the night is relatively low, about zero, since there's no daylight. Then dawn hits, and the amount of shortwave radiation increases until solar noon, and then goes down. And the amount of longwave radiation coming in tends to be relatively constant, but a little bit higher in the afternoon than it is in the morning. Now the shortwave radiation coming out mirrors the amount of shortwave radiation coming in, but it's a lot lower, and that's the amount of reflectance that there is. And again, that's gonna vary over the course of a day. And again, the amount of long wave radiation going out is gonna balance, for all intents and purposes, the amount of long wave radiation coming in. But you can see that even during the night, there's long wave radiation going out of the system too. When you add all these up, you get balance, for example, but it's important to know that the patterns of short wave radiation during the day vary as insulation changes and the patterns of long wave radiation, both coming in and out of an ecosystem, vary also. Now the next thing that we want to understand is essentially what controls how much of the energy comes into a place and then how much gets lost in terms of shortwave radiation going out, so how much is being reflected, and then how much determines how much long wave radiation both comes in and out. And so what are the properties of an ecosystem that determine shortwave and long wave radiation going out of a system, for example. 